I think we are ready. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, webinar, this uh, uh, launch event of the book, New Perspectives on Diplomacy. My name is Flavia Gasbarri. I am a lecturer in the Department of War Studies, and I, I am a member of the Center for Ground Strategy, who is, uh, which is organizing this, uh, this event uh, today. And today I have the privilege to chair this uh, book launch. I have to say I am particularly happy to chair um, this event. Firstly, because I'm one of the contributors to the book. So I have seen the birth and the development of this project. So I'm very happy to be here today to celebrate this uh, publication. And then I'm very happy because uh, uh, I am here with the editors of the book who happen to be old friends of mine. So I'm going to now introduce the speakers to you, starting, of course, with uh, the legendary professor Jack Spence, who is a true legend in the Department of World Studies. He's professor in the department, and uh, he has been one of the leading figures uh, in international relations for several uh, decades. I don't even know where to start to mention all the achievements of his incredible careers. Um, he has worked in many different universities in UK, in the United States, and in South Africa. From 1991 to 1997, he was the director of studies at the Royal Institute of International Affairs at Chatham House. He has extensively researched and published in the field of diplomacy, nationalism, and Africa. He has been awarded three honorary doctorates and four honorary fellowship, one from King's College London, of course. I think Professor Spence has tried to get his retirement like three times in the past, but we really do not want to let him go. Up to the point that in 2014, the Department of World Studies has established the Jack Spence BA Prize for International Relations, which is awarded to students who achieve exceptionally uh, academic work um, in the BA uh, in the international uh, relations. So thank you very much, for Professor Spence, for being here today and for continuing to be such an inspiration to all of us. Of course, this book would have not been possible without uh, the hard work of the other two editors, Dr. Claire York, first of all, who is a visiting fellow at the Center for Grand Strategy at King's College. Uh, between 2018 and 2020, Dr. York was um, a Henry Kissinger postdoctor fellow at Yale University. Her writing and research explores the role and limitation of empathy and emotions in international affairs and diplomacy. And then last but not least, Dr. Alastair Masser, who is a visiting fellow at the Africa Research Group at King's College. His research focuses on conflict, security, and development in Sub-Saharan Africa. He's a former UK government uh, special advisor, and he has published a number of reports on issues, including the drivers of development, post-conflict uh, post -post reconciliation, emigration, and uh, trafficking. He's currently working on his new book based on his PhD that he got at King's College on uh, UK-Nigerian security cooperation. So thank you to the three editors for being here with us. Um, I think the order is uh, Professor Spence first, then Dr. York, no, no, then Dr. Masser, and then Dr. York. So the speakers will, of course, uh, introduce the book, speak about this uh, uh, great publication, and then, of course, we will open the floor for comments and questions from the public. I would kindly ask you uh, to post your uh, question on the Q&A uh, session, uh, on the Q&A section that you can find at the bottom of your screen, and I will read uh, the questions to the uh, speakers. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, Professor Spence, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Flavia, thank you very much for those very kind words. Um, words of welcome. Um, I did appreciate them. And um, may I add your general welcome to um, everyone else who has zoomed in to participate in this uh, particular launch. I've never done this before, uh, so it's a learning experience, um, but so far, so good. 
Um, we're all delighted, my two editors, my two co-editors, and my chairperson, Flavia, we're all delighted that, that over a hundred people have in fact signed up uh, to take part in this launch. And uh, we do express our thanks and gratitude to everyone who has shown such considerable interest. Um, I personally owe a profound debt of gratitude to a number of individuals. Uh, first of all, my wife, Sue, uh, without whom none of this would ever be possible. She's been a source of enormous encouragement, kindness and love to me in all these years. Um, and indeed my daughter, Rachel, uh, who similarly has, has been a, a major help and, and assistant, particularly today, because without her, we wouldn't have been able to zoom in as we have done because she is much more of an authority than I can ever be on matters technological. So I'm profoundly grateful to them. I also like to express my thanks to uh, Sir Lawrence Friedman and Professor Miles Wickstead, both of whom were kind enough to write forwards uh, to each of the volumes the two volumes that we have produced on diplomacy, theory and practice. Um, again, um, it was good of them to take time out of very busy schedules and uh, what they've had to say is much appreciated, certainly by me and by my two editors. Um, I must obviously thank very warmly uh, and sincerely my two co-editors, uh, Claire York and Alistair Massa. Uh, they've both borne uh, the heat and burden, the major share of the work required to getting both these volumes into print. It was certainly a great pleasure uh, to work with them. They were wonderfully patient with me. Um, they were always um, as, uh, acute in discussion, um, always um, perceptive in judgment. Um, I do hold them both in high regard. It was a pleasure to do academic business with them. And I do hope we may have another opportunity in due course. Um, I must also thank Jessica Carden, who has helped to plan and arrange this uh, particular launch. It was probably a learning experience for her uh, as much as me, um, but I am indeed, as I'm sure I speak for both my editors, really uh, very, very grateful to her for her efforts in getting this underway. Um, and of course, I must uh, thank uh, the editorial team at Bloomsbury, um, uh, Olivia Dello and uh, Tomas Hoskins. Um, they were enormously efficient, competent, and indeed a pleasure to work with. And uh, I'm sure I speak both for my co-editors and everyone else involved. And finally, I must thank um, my colleagues uh, in the uh, Department of War Studies. It's an enormous department. It's nearly a hundred strong, leaving aside those who teach at the Star College and all. But I was made welcome, have spent 20 years there, have just in fact retired. Um, and I owe a special debt to um, James Gow and um, the head of the department at the time who appointed me, Chris Dandeker, and indeed all their successors. I've had a happy, very happy 20 years there, uh, though I still have a foothold in the sense that I still have two or three PhDs to finish off before they finish me off. Um, 
As for the provenance of this particular text, um, I think most of you know who know me know that I live in Ludlow in deepest Shropshire. Um, we have the great lung, the great benefit of uh, the Mortimer Forest. And in that forest, most days, uh, I walk my two terrier dogs and brood about matters academic. Uh, and this project, uh, the two volumes on diplomacy, which we produced, in effect, uh, uh, were thought about and decided upon on one of my many walks through the, 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 through the forest. Um, um, the whole idea uh, took shape in my mind because I realized that the Department of War Studies has several hundred doctoral students, several of whom have been doing their doctorates, completed them, doctorates on some aspect, some dimension of diplomacy. And um, we've tried to reflect that particular group of young colleagues, young academics in the two volumes of diplomacy that are being launched today. Uh, after all, these young men and women, all of whom are represented, well represented in these two volumes, are at the cutting edge of the subject as their PhDs so clearly demonstrate. And I did have the thought that it would be a great idea to get them to at least give us a summary of their basic findings from their doctorates as chapters in these two volumes. And this they've all done superbly. And I am personally very grateful to the efforts they put in. There are some gray beards, I won't mention names, including myself in the volume, and they too have made a significant contribution. Um, why think about diplomacy? Why study it? Why write about it? Uh, my own personal view is that diplomacy is, is a liberal construct that its values, the values that underpin good diplomacies, powerful negotiation, agreement between states. Um, the good diplomacy is like the oil or the grease in the machinery of international politics. It's crucial to hold states together, to keep them collaborating where and when they can. And that's always been its fascination for me. Um, again, let me offer you a tiny autobiographical fragment. Um, when I was very young, on the brink of going to university in Johannesburg, South Africa, leaving school, I was nobbled, as the phrase goes, by the Department of Foreign Affairs. They had heard about me from my godfather and school teachers and so forth, and they were trying to persuade me to apply for the diplomatic service in South Africa um, as, a, as a junior cadet. And at the time, I, I was intrigued and, and, and really fascinated by the idea of becoming a diplomat, hence my interest developed from those very early days. But I declined their invitation as politely as I could, as diplomatically as I could, even at 17, uh, because I didn't want to spend my life wandering around capitals as a diplomat justifying apartheid. I had two other choices as a career. One was to be a parish priest in the Church of England, but that's another story for another time. And the other was ultimately to become an academic, which I did and have enjoyed enormously. Um, Again, let me just make one last point. It, it seems to me that, that what diplomacy does is make for a degree of cooperation between states. No state is entirely self-sufficient. All states have to um, deal with each other. And diplomacy is one of the great institutions of international relations insofar as it makes that cooperation possible. 
I've described it elsewhere as the oil or the grease, as it were, that holds or tends to keep the machinery of international politics running. And that's always been its great fascination for me. And I've been very fortunate at King's um, with successive heads of department, including Professor Mike Goodman, who's been very encouraging about this project, who always allowed me to teach diplomacy in the Department of War Studies um, as a liberal enterprise. And uh, it's given me enormous pleasure to spend all those years at King's unexpectedly brought into the department, as I say, by James Gar, who is a contributor to one of our volumes, and by Chris Danica, who was then head. I will leave it at that, ladies and gentlemen, um, and wish you well. My two colleagues will give you some indication of the substance of these two volumes. Here they are, if you haven't seen them already. Um, but uh, I'm delighted to have been part of this enterprise, and I'll now turn you over to um, uh, my two co-editors. Um, uh, Claire, you might care to begin and then follow your, follow, follow with Alice. So thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you, Professor Spence, for uh, uh, introducing the book. Um, I think, um, Dr. Massa, you go second, right? Okay, yep. so the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Flavia. And, and thanks, Jack, for, for kicking us off with your normal mixture of great anecdotes and humour and wisdom. Uh, and thanks for showing me up by wearing a, a jacket and tie. I knew I should have uh, dressed up a little bit smarter for this, I'm sorry. Um, I think I also just want to start off with a, a quick note of thanks to uh, both Fla Flavia and to the Department of War Studies. Um, not only for hosting us this afternoon, but for providing such a wonderful and enriching intellectual home for us over the last uh, number of years uh, for each and every one of us. And I think that's important in terms of uh, the relevance to this project simply because it's that interdisciplinary nature of the department, um, which is a real, a genuine strength and a strength from which, you know, which we've drawn upon uh, for the basis of this project. So we, you know, we've been able to, uh, without too much work, get our hands on specialists who, are, who focus on history, who focus on politics, who focus on diplomacy, who focus on conflict, conflict resolution, and all of the other things that, that Kings is renowned for around the world. And actually having that, uh, that level of expertise all under one roof has been a real, uh, a real resource for us to draw on for this project. Um, also, I just wanted to do, uh, sound a quick note of thanks for our fantastic contributors, uh, Flavia amongst them. Um, I'm delighted to say I think quite a few of them are on the call uh, with us today, um, even though we can't see you and we can't be doing this, uh, this launch event probably in quite the way we all anticipated when the project got underway. Um, I think we, yeah, we've all been indebted to, to you all. You've been fantastic uh, to work with. And I think the, the real richness of these two volumes is a result of your expertise and your energy. So thank you for that. Um, just, I'm gonna sort of get us underway with a brief uh, overview just of the, the genesis of this project just so you can probably help sort of contextualize it in your, in your own minds. Um, before going on to just uh, to, to discuss in a little bit more detail one or two of the themes which which have emerged and I think you know for for Claire and I this is uh, in large part Jack gave his own uh, explanation as to the provenance of this this project but for, for Claire and I you know it as, as often uh, is the case with all good uh, ideas it, it was uh, conceived in a, in a pub in the days where we could all get together and share a beer um, and we, I remember we'd taken Jack for, for a beer in the, uh, the pub we always frequented uh, around the corner from, from King's College. And we were just sort of reflecting on uh, a whole range of, of issues, uh, mostly contemporary. But then the more you start putting on the thread of Jack's experience and memory, you realise that the thread is a long one. Um, and it wasn't too long. I don't think Jack's ever actually given away his real age. Um, but it, uh, it was interesting to see that... Um, yeah, we realised that Jack's career in international relations had, you know, was I think sixty years uh, long and had borne witness to some really quite fantastic events and shifts and trends. Uh, and within that was a lot of wisdom and insight which we could draw on. And we realised actually that it was a career that spanned the Cuban Missile Crisis to coronavirus, which 
I think when you pause and reflect, you know, it, it's quite a span and there's been a lot of interesting, uh, a lot of interesting events in between. Um, so on top of wanting to, to draw on that expertise, we always wanted, also wanted to, uh, I think, collectively explore some of the shifts which we all are familiar with uh, uh, to some extent and also to explore and examine some of the, the shifts and trends which we're perhaps not so familiar with. Um, and I think that was born of a desire to try, you know, I think many international relations scholars uh, attempt to do, just to, to make sense of the world that we're living in. And I think it's fair to say that at the moment it is, uh, it feels as complex and as insecure, uh, certainly at any point in my lifetime. Um, and you know, even in the last uh, few years, we've just seen such, uh, such significant uh, uh, fluctuations in, in uh, the international relations scene and the international order. I think uh, concepts around the balance of power, whether we are in now and a, we've moved from a by, uh, by state of bipolarity to a state of multipolarity. And are we again with the, uh, the growing Sino-US rivalry soon gonna be back in a state of, of bipolarity? Um, and and what, all, what that means for our collective security and prosperity. Um, I also think it's probably just worth touching on, um, as Jack did to some extent, just the, the context of this uh, project. The idea was, was really conceived um, around the time of the, the 2016 US president, presidential election uh, and the, the Brexit vote in the UK, um, which again, you know, felt, you know, it doesn't feel like it was long ago, but also, you know, the scars are probably on all of our backs to some extent. Um, and, you know, at least for me, I don't remember a time in, in international politics where things have felt quite so turbulent and uncertain as that year in particular. And I think it's interesting that we've brought the project into land, as Jack said, with the with the help of our, our wonderful team at, at Bloomsbury, um, around, you know, as we are hopefully lifting, uh, lifting ourselves out of lockdown, um, having spent a year in the midst of a global pandemic. And I just think, yeah, for me at least, if you wanted, I guess, uh, an illustration of how turbulent and unpredictable the international scene can be uh, you'd, you'd be hard pushed to find a better example than what we've seen in the last uh, five years in which we've been doing this book um just in terms of the concept i think we as i mentioned we were very keen to be uh trying to explore some of these issues and, and what they what they mean and whether um diplomacy is still able as, as jeffrey berridge suggested to whether it still reasonably reflects uh and reinforces international politics and international relations or whether diplomacy itself is now being uh, required to evolve uh, at a faster rate than perhaps we've seen in some time. Uh, and also, as I said, to, to draw upon uh, the really quite extraordinary exp uh, experience and expertise that we have within the War Studies Department. So I think, you know, as, as um, some of my colleagues have already mentioned, we had people that have worked uh, in government, people who are obviously academics, people who have worked in the field of diplomacy themselves. Um, and people that have served in the military, in the intelligence services. And I think all of those insights and all of that experience is, is, uh, is something that we've really drawn on uh, for the purpose of, the, of this book. And not only that, you know, I think we are conscious that this, this is a, a UK centred project and a lot of these perspectives are largely Western, but we've also tried to make sure they are as much as humanly possible, uh, somewhat intergenerational. Uh, and also we've got a, a mix of genders and nationalities and so on, which, which we hope has really added some strength and, and different perspectives to this book. Um, I think, uh, yeah, what I, I'm very conscious that we, in conceiving this piece of work, we are, I think it's worth saying almost as a, a disclaimer, we were never trying to, uh, you know, to, to write the last word on diplomacy. And we, I think we certainly were very conscious that we weren't going to be able to produce an exhaustive list uh, of, uh, of new perspectives, but we've tried to certainly touch on some of the major, major trends that have emerged. Um, and I just want to uh, just want to raise the fact that I think in the, the two volumes and the 20 chapters which we've produced as part of this work, it's very clear that there are a number of, of what I would term sort of golden threads uh, working their way through the various volumes. And I think a lot of the chapters touch in different ways and different um, using different evidence and different perspectives on some of those on some of the same issues. So I, there was just given that we, you know, I certainly don't want to um, uh, certainly don't want to be 
held accountable for, for misrepresenting any of, of our wonderful contributors' work. But I just wanted to touch on, on kind of one theme which I thought was particularly, particularly salient uh, across the two volumes, and perhaps we can, uh, can tee up some conversation uh, in the Q&A session just before uh, handing over to, to Claire. And that is around what I'm, I'm provocatively perhaps uh, calling the democratization of diplomacy. And I think uh, to, to put that in some kind of contact, context, what we're really saying, and I think what we've been seeing uh, in recent years is that there are, put very simply, more actors involved in the process of diplomacy and probably in international relations than we've ever seen before. And I think you, you can see that in, in whether it's corporations uh, and the movement around uh, commercial diplomacy and, and the ever in, uh, increasing involvement of governments in, in trade promotion efforts, as we've seen uh, in the, uh, the commercial diplomacy programme that the coalition uh, government in the UK unleashed after 2010 as part of the austerity, uh, anti-austerity, sorry, not anti-austerity, trying to deal with the, uh, the global financial crisis and, it, and its aftermath. Um, to some of the social movements that we've seen uh, really taking root and also not only that the the increasing uh, relevance of identity politics within international relations and the way that diplomacy uh, is impacted um, but we've also seen um, what I think has been a surprising but at the same time sounds paradoxical perhaps a predictable trend of the uh, of individuals having increasing influence uh, over the course of international relations and individuals that are specifically uh, unofficial in that they are not uh, attached in any any official capacity to, to a government uh, department or agency um, and it just you know some fun stats uh, emerged during the the research process uh, for these books this is always the case and one that I, I really liked that I only discovered actually recently was that um, if you want an illustration of this look no further than one 18 year old Greta Thunberg um, who is perhaps the most high profile uh, advocate on the issue of climate change around the world. Um, she, at the touch of a button uh, on her Twitter account, has access to an audience of nearly 5 million people on this issue, um, which is about one and a half million more than President Biden's new special envoy for climate, John Kerry. Um, so I think I'm not suggesting Twitter is how diplomacy is, you know, is now the mainstream uh, means of diplomacy. Of course, I'm not. But I think it just gives you an illustration of just how um, just how things have changed and how how much of diplomacy and influence and uh, those elements within international relations are not necessarily the purview simply of governments and foreign ministers uh, anymore as they perhaps once were. Um, I think another another key issue around that has influenced this uh, democratization, as I'm calling it, of, of diplomacy is the simple uh, connectiveness uh, of the world we live in today. So uh, we now exist, as I think lots of us know, in a, in a world where 50%, uh, or I think now more than 50% of the, of the world's population has access to the internet, and some two thirds of, of people around the world own uh, a mobile device. Um, we have in companies like Facebook, uh, uh, and bear in mind Facebook, the company only founded in, in 2006, we now have a company which has an estimated value greater than, I think, 164 of the 193 members of the United Nations. Um, and not only does it have that kind of, uh, of uh, financial capital muscle behind it, um, importantly, it has close to 3 uh, billion monthly active users, uh, which is at least a third of the global population. So if you're trying to imagine who is able to have who is able to reach and access the world's biggest audience these days um i think it, it'd be fair to say it, it it's not necessarily uh diplomats and foreign ministries um just one, one other fact uh just because i always think this is fun about twitter um there was an average uh of about i think there's an average of about 500 million tweets sent uh, each and every day of which form as former president donald trump was responsible for about 20 or 25 of those each and every day but i think again it's just interesting to see how much of the world how the world is communicating uh, increasingly across borders and across states and what challenges that therefore poses for for diplomats trying to do their everyday job so just before um, handing over to Claire, I just want to touch on 
uh, on some of the implications of this democratization of, of diplomacy and perhaps, uh, as I said, stimulate some discussion um, when we get into the Q&A uh, section. But I think it's very much worth us all considering, you know, what are the implications um, of, uh, of these trends, not only for foreign policymakers, but also for the diplomats, which are inevitably uh, downstream trying to do their bidding uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think there is, we have to recognize the extent to which public opinion is now uh, shaping uh, international politics in a way that therefore inevitably has a knock-on implication for the practice of, of diplomacy and how it's conducted around the world. And I think that's a particular problem uh, inevitably um, for countries where public opinion matters. So this is arguably more of an issue for democracies than it is autocracy, autocracies around the world. Um, and that is an interesting price, uh, interestingly high price to be paying for, for free and open societies. But I think it's an important point for us to discuss. Um, I also think it makes the, uh, the issue of defining national interest increasingly difficult. Um, it, it risks, I think that the, the influence of such, uh, of the, such a large influence from uh, the public and from public opinion risks at times meaning that foreign policy, which is inevitably reactive and, and managerial to some extent, because that's what, that's what diplomats and foreign policy makers are often trying to do. They're, not, they're often trying to, to manage and, and uh, mitigate risk as much as they are to reshape uh, the world around them. But I think it means that it's difficult for nations to, to formulate foreign policy that is coherent and long term uh, because the politicians that, uh, that conceive foreign policy cannot, cannot, uh, cannot be deaf to, to a lot of the public opinion and public concerns that are being raised ever more vocally on, on social media and other platforms. And I think for, for the UK, this is, um, for me, made it made UK foreign policy uh, making, not just the process, but the, the output as well, increasingly muddled. Uh, it feels to me, I think the UK is a good example of the country which is trying to, to some extent, push at the ocean uh, it, on many different fronts. Um, and I think part of that is a result of, um, uh, part of it is a result of that public opinion influence on, on politics and policy making. Um, I also think it's uh, the democratization of diplomacy, as I'm calling it, also risks, I think, to some extent, skewing foreign policy priorities. Um, and I remember there was a, a US, I think it was a Pew uh, opinion poll survey uh, back in 2018, which, which asked uh, average Americans what was their, what should be the number one priority for both the administration uh, and for Congress. Uh, and the, what came out top of the list, ranked number one was terrorism. Uh, even though at the time the, the, the risk of a, UK na a US national being killed in a terrorist attack was something like one in 75,000. But it's very interesting to see if, the, if there is public demand for action at a political level um, on a particular issue which pertains to foreign policy, just how that filters its way down the, the food chain and suddenly that becomes uh, very much part of the, the everyday diplomatic discourse. Um, just also want to touch on the issue uh, of transparency and what and how that has has been how we've seen that evolve in in recent decades. I think in many respects, as, as I touched on before, that the fact that we many of us are fortunate to live in free and open societies means that we are able to hold uh, not only our politicians uh, to account, but inevitably the, the foreign policy makers of our nations to account. Uh, and I think foreign policy making as a result uh, of um, the, the increase in transparency we've seen has made, I think, it, I think it has made it more accountable, even though there are clearly still clandestine elements around intelligence and so on, which will, will for good reason, stay, uh, stay secret. But it also, I think, another interesting corollary of this is to see the way in which uh, your nation's international reputations can ebb and flow very, very quickly based on just the sheer accessibility of information that we are able to glean. So I, I think two obvious examples we've, we've all uh, will all be familiar with from just recent months will be just the extent to which the the U.S. Uh, the um, opinion of U.S. of the U.S. and the U.S. administration plummeted around the world in the, in the wake of the the assault on the Capitol in January, 
but also to see how nations like uh, China have been really wrestling with the fact uh, that their reputation is consistently being uh, battered as a result of their treatment of Uyghur Muslims in that country. And I think it's interesting to see, um, you know, they, they, they're, that's two, an example of two countries which are diametrically opposed in, in the sense that one is very open and transparent and one is clearly not. And actually they are still ultimately wrestling with the same challenges that whatever they are trying to do within their borders uh, is ultimately visible. Um, but the extent to which it is visible it, it is clearly different. But the point being that both countries' international reputations are able to, to take a real hit very quickly once these, these issues emerge. Um, I think uh, a couple of, just a couple of other points. Um, I think we've also seen the, and perhaps the, the coronavirus pandemic has been uh, arguably the, the most apposite illustration of this, just uh, the high stakes that are involved in multilateralism um, and getting multilateralism right. And I think if we are, I think sort of we, the three of us argue in, in the introduction and conclusions to this book that we are within some form of a new era of multipolarity. And I think with a new era of multipolarity requires a recommitment to multilateralism uh, because I, I would argue that the two go hand in glove. And I think it's been very interesting to see some of the real genuine uh, successes of multilateral cooperation when it comes to, to vaccine uh, production, vaccine rollout, and so on, but also some of the very clear sticking points um, we've seen over, over recent weeks and months in terms of which nations are prioritised, what happens to nations in the developing world, and whether we really do take a, a global uh, approach to global problems in the way that we perhaps should. Um, just, I realise I'm probably prattling on, I should cede the floor um, to, to Claire at some point, but just one last point uh, just to leave you all with. And I think that's just to, to sort of, I think one thing that came through very clearly uh, in, in this work and the research uh, we conducted and the contributors we talked to, and, and actually some of the practitioners we talked to as well, is uh, that I think we owe diplomats a, a very great debt uh, and I think, you know, they are increasingly being asked to do ever more, take on ever more uh, roles uh, and often in a, in a context where uh, the budget for diplomats and for their uh, for foreign ministries of foreign affairs and state departments and so on are being cut. Um, and I think, you know, just uh, to give an illustration, so I, I remember during uh, my time in government was when um, the Foreign Office was, was trying to get uh, long-standing diplomats to, to take a secondment in business so that they could come back after six months to a year with all this shiny commercial experience, which they would then uh, help them in their efforts to promote UK business and trade overseas. And, you know, like lots of government initiatives, it, it made a lot of sense on paper, but the reality was, if you talk to people who were involved in it, that they were simply being asked to do yet one more thing. Um, and I think, you know, we need to remember that the, Diplomats are in many respects polymaths, um, but there's only so much that they are able to do uh, on a shoestring budget. And I think we should bear that in mind. And also, uh, as I said, I think we owe them a, a very great debt of gratitude. Um, so with that, I'm gonna um, hand over to Claire, um, uh, just to take us through uh, some of the chapters and some of the insights from our contributors. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Lester. I think it's incredibly interesting to hear uh, how in such a multifaceted project with so many perspectives, so many people, so many you know, different approaches, uh, we can still identify some, some patterns and common points. So I think that that's certainly a point that uh, we can discuss later on in the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. York, the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much. And it's really lovely to be here and to see so many people, um, friends and colleagues, um, who work in space. And I'd like to echo my thanks as well for everybody who's been a part of this project. We've got such a rich um, and eclectic collection of chapters and it's been a real pleasure to work with so many brilliant colleagues. So thank you to all the contributors. Um, thank you also to Bloomsbury and all the publishing team, to all of our colleagues um, in the Department of War Studies and my colleagues in Yale. Um, and it's just been, so wonderful to see these volumes come together and to be a part of 
um, a collection of people who really believe in the power of diplomacy. Um, so in my co comments, what I really want to do is walk you through what these two volumes do. I'm conscious you're not going to be able to get your hands on them until the 22nd of April. Um, so I'm going to give you um, this is the first volume and this is the second volume. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview about the core themes that we look at and what new perspectives they offer. Um, and for me personally, I began my academic career as an undergraduate shortly after 9-11, um, when a lot of the discipline was very focused on security and terrorism and on this new um, kind of far greater threat that had emerged. And over the years, I think all of us in our conversations have reflected on the fact that diplomacy has sometimes been lost in our conversations of security, of how we look after states, how we look after citizens, how we improve society and work with other societies in other countries um, for the collective good, to find cooperation, to solve global challenges that we all face. And we're seeing that so much right now when we look at climate change, when we look at the pandemic, this need for diplomacy, this need for collaboration. And in these books, we have examples of both how they are integral to international relations and in the broadest sense of diplomacy, to security, to defense, um, to climate change, to human rights, to well-being, to the protection of social movements and those basic rights that we hold dear. Um, but also new perspectives and the kind of the themes and the lenses that are emerging within the scholarship and within the practice of diplomacy. And so the central tenets are very much reflected. Diplomacy at its essence remains the same. It's still very much about representation, communication, negotiation, the pursuit of interests and the development of relationships. And so we have um, chapters on negotiation, for example, by Barbara Zanchetta, who's in the Department of War Studies, who looks at um, summit diplomacy. We also have Flavia's own chapter, which is on um, negotiations and mediation um, it, among African states and kind of the, the role of individuals in that as well, the importance of negotiation and of having good mediators. We have as well this fascinating account um, from former ambassador Nigel Thorpe, who really reflects on his life as a diplomat. And it's great to be able to include the account of someone who's experienced it firsthand. And especially during a fascinating period in British diplomacy and world politics, where you had the Cold War, you had these shifts um, after the fall of the Berlin Wall in how Europe and the world thought about one another. Um, and then to see the kind of recent decision of the UK to leave the EU and to chart a new path um, in the international system. And we've seen as well as part of this that as we consider these central tenets, there's also real shifts that are taking place, changes in the norms of diplomacy, what is permissible. We've seen in the way that certain states conduct their politics and their diplomacy right now, that they're often going around and circumventing some of the traditional norms that we've seen. Um, some of the codes of conduct that diplomats have hold dear that you hope that you will see in the work of people like Ernest Sato and Jeffrey Berridge and Hedley Bull. Um, the way that they're often um, causing provocations as a way to bounce people into decisions. They're often not going through the traditional um, mediums and the traditional channels of diplomacy and that poses new questions to what we're going to be dealing with in the future. Um, one of the chapters one, that opens volume one is by Professor Mervyn Frost that looks at the kind of enduring relevance of ethics and what that really means in diplomacy, which is something that we all consider very important. What does it mean um, to have good conduct in diplomacy? What is the role of ethics within this space and how does it help to shape the conduct of those involved and the kind of values and ideals that we hold at the center of it? Um, we see throughout it as well, the enduring relevance of alliances, which I think um, as Alistair um, and Jack have both alluded to, have seen a number of challenges in recent years. I think if we look at America, um, I've just spent two years there where it was very clear as a Brit in America that it was struggling with its international repu reputation. It's very hard to view a state as the great power that it is considered to be when it is withdrawing from international alliances, when it is challenging um, the kind of cooperation that's um, 
emphasized in organizations like NATO, in NAFTA, when it's um, criticizing allies in ways that we've not really seen. And as Alistair said, on social media, using forms of diplomacy and social interaction that seem quite new to the way that we um, operate within this space. Um, we've seen the challenges um, to institutions and international organizations, which really poses questions about what do we do next? How do we reinvigorate them? How do we ensure that they are solid and strong and vibrant and able to respond to the threats in the future, especially if we're looking at global health challenges and the need to have an international and collective response to prevent both future challenges and also ensure that people have the provisions and the solutions to um, coronavirus that we so need. Within diplomacy, so much of it is also about the management of conflict and disagreements. At the moment, we're seeing um, an escalation of rhetoric between the US and the West and China, um, which requires diplomacy to find solutions. It provokes questions about how do you talk to people that you disagree with? How do you find common ground on which to build a dialogue and find sources of um, cooperation, of collaboration, in order to try to avoid the inevitable um, march to war, which sometimes seems um, to be what certain people in certain quarters are expecting. Um, and as part of this, we also see the centrality of nuclear weapons to how we think about um, diplomacy and the coercive dimensions of diplomacy, the importance of having certain levers and hard power mechanisms in place in order to provide credible threats. So people know that you mean it when you say, this is my red line. And we see in a chapter by Jean-Francois Belanger, who is a colleague of mine from Yale, the kind of enduring role and importance of nuclear weapons. I think most recently, we've also seen how important it is to conduct negotiations according to um, ideas of collegiality. Um, personally watching some of the Brexit negotiations, seeing the way in which British rhetoric towards Europe has become increasingly hostile, poses problems for future relationships, future di diplomatic alliances and the ability to work together. And we're really seeing the dangers of um, problems in how we conduct diplomacy when we look at the kind of violence that's erupting in Northern Ireland again, and that's really posing a challenge for the Good Friday Agreement um, and for stability in the region. Um, another area that is really vital is intelligence, which we don't always talk about when we talk about diplomacy, but really has a central role. And um, we've got a great chapter from Daniel Lomas on that, where he looks not only at the significance of intelligence, but also how it's adapting to greater transparency, as we've seen through um, the exposure of cables on WikiLeaks and the kind of the ways in which people have to navigate this new information landscape. Um, and this new information landscape is something as well that um, Oprah Friedman also talks about when he's looking at information and the use of information as a source of power, both for warfare and for diplomacy to exert on others and to really provoke um, other states to respond. In, as we've seen, for example, with um, Russian interference, the use of disinformation there, and how it has been able to challenge uh, domestic politics to kind of have an influence on the ways in which societies conduct themselves and what they value, what resonates, and what information they're drawn to. Another aspect is the emergence, as Alistair said, of far greater groups within this space. Um, Alistair's own chapter looks at the importance of security cooperation, the kind of the ways in which people can cooperate to find mutual uh, solutions based on security. Um, and we also see Samir Puri talk about proxy groups and the rise of non-state actors and the ways in which they are conducting diplomacy and what they have to say as well about how diplomacy is conducted in this space, how states are maybe using non-state actors in order to develop their ends and further their interests. There's a huge amount to cover and I don't wanna talk for too long because I wanna make sure we have time for questions, but some of the new perspectives, the themes that really stood out for me is the significance of ideas and discourses and identities and how diplomacy is informed and understood. It's 
a constructivist and a critical theoretical lens. Um, we have a chapter, for example, by Pablo de Oriana on identity and the way in which diplomacy is written and how identities are constructed through diplomatic discourses and cables and reporting. We also have a chapter from Harris, uh, Harris Kamel on the importance of identities in climate change and how people use identities associated with climate change and the environment to mobilize different support and different politics. And this connects to another theme that is very close to my heart, which is emotions. Um, and Philippe Beauregard has written a great chapter on emotional leadership and how leaders use emotions as a way to resonate with populations, to move them, to encourage them to follow their lead and to connect with them and empower them. Um, and Francesca Grinelli has also written about trust and the way in which trust binds people to certain movements and particularly social movements, how that trust has a power to connect different people in this space. And it's something that I think is incredibly important um, to consider how, what are the emotions that are dynamic and powerful in the diplomatic space? How are they shaped and what role and influence do they exert? Another theme that emerged repeatedly was practice theory and a real focus on what is it that diplomats do in the everyday? What is the kind of the practice, the conduct, the habits, the routines? How is it constructed and constituted? And that really emerges through a number of chapters that many of the authors are really looking at, not just the theoretical, but the applied dimensions, what this means to us um, in the Foreign Office, in the State Department, um, in the various departments around the world um, and embassies around the world where diplomats are operating. And another element that I think is really useful is how we look at history to teach us about the challenges that we are faced with today to provide lessons on what could be done differently, what actually could be more effective if we learned from people from the past. And Andrew Earhart, another colleague from the Department of War Studies, looks at the case of the fifth, Mar fifth Marquess of Lansdowne and what his example can reveal about how we approach strategy today. Alongside this focus on the traditional tenets of diplomacy, we have an increasing um, emergence of small states as actors that we need to be paying far more attention to. And this is something that Professor James Gow talks about in his own chapter. And it's something that I know is emerging in the War Studies Department itself, that actually, if we're going to be talking about an international system and an international arena, we need to be looking at all the players within that, of all sizes, that actually different smaller states have other aspects and other levers of power that they use to great effect that we need to be able to understand more comprehensively. Um, and we also need to be able to understand those non-state actors and how they operate in this space, how they use the power that they have, the, le the levers that they have in order to exert influence on others. And there's a fascinating chapter as well by Garrett Kurtz on how people choose not to engage in diplomacy, this idea of counter diplomacy um, and what that means. A critical element that Alistair has touched on as well is that the public are increasingly involved in how diplomacy is conducted. And in, in truth, it was always the case that the public would have had um, an influence over the shape of international relations, but it's increasingly so now. And Thomas Colley provides a fascinating um, investigation of how the British public sees British foreign policy and often the disconnect that exists between the official rhetoric and the official policy and how people are interpreting it and what resonates with them at a more local level. And this is something that is going to become increasingly important. We saw its significance during Brexit, the role of um, public narratives in shaping um, political policy and political direction. Um, and really one final point is this idea of increasing the number of voices that we have in this space, making sure that both in the study and practice of diplomacy, we have far more diversity, far more representation, far more inclusion, that it becomes a space where we're really able to listen and engage with people um, and find something that is far more um, representative and diverse to provide more long lasting um, and responsive solutions. Um, what I love from my own personal perspective, um, given my work on empathy, is that this is actually a theme that emerges throughout this importance of diverse voices, the importance of understanding and listening as being at the heart of empathy. 
um, move away, this move away from the great powers to a much more pluralistic international system made up of states, large and small, non-state actors, organizations, the public. And although we're seeing that America is now starting on this kind of an effort to re-engage with the world and to reassert itself as a great power, I think the very fact we've seen this decline, we've seen its influence wane, shows that there's a greater need to have far more collaboration, far more working collectively to find common solutions and far more ability to really look at what different people can contribute to really provide um, the needs and the interests that we're all trying to meet within the space. And the advent of multipolarity really demands new approaches. Um, so I'm gonna leave it there. Oh, final one is technology. I felt like um, Alistair really spoke about the power of technology. And we also have a chapter um, <clears throat> by Inga and Nega on um, social media and its role in the Arab Spring and really what that means for how diplomats respond to public protests, how they respond to social media and influence and how vital that is um, to ensure that public communications and public diplomacy is not just being reactive, but is able to get ahead. Um, so, um, that, sorry, that was Inga Trag and uh, Nega Anger. I didn't give their full names. Um, but what I think we've got here is such a rich and vibrant collection of chapters. Um, it's really wonderful to see it come together. And I hope you will all enjoy them uh, when they're released next week. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Claire, for this uh, overview of uh, such a complex uh, project. Actually, you outlined basically all the hot topics that we are all debating and discussing. I, I teach several modules on diplomacy and foreign policy, and all the topics that you have mentioned have come across in, uh, you know, in our teaching, in our study uh, in some way. So uh, this is certainly a, a, a very much needed contribution to the literature and uh, the, is going certainly to be the core textbook in our modules next year for sure. So thank you very much uh, to the three uh, speakers. Uh, I think we can open the floor for uh, questions. We already have a few questions. I'm going to read uh, them um, loudly and uh, uh, most of them are, you know, directed to the three panelists. So it's up to you and who wants to uh, intervene first. Okay, so first of, first of all, uh, first question, uh, um, generally speaking, how are you defining diplomacy in the volumes? Have you provided a definition, some sort of definition of diplomacy in the, in the two volumes? Can you hear that? Mm -hmm. you said, how are you defining diplomacy in the different volumes? Oh, is that to me? I don't know who it's to. Yes, please, Professor Spence, if you want to. Uh, How are you defining diplomacy in the two volumes? Good question. Uh, that's, uh, that's a good question. Um, I think I, I define diplomacy, and I think that comes through my preface, and I think it comes through what Claire and Alice have had to say. I think diplomacy is essentially um, a structure and process of negotiation between sovereign states, although I grant you there are more actors emerging uh, into the diplomatic world. Um, and I, th I think what I, I would argue is that um, what's interesting about diplomacy um, is that it underpins and informs our every day by day lives. Uh, let me give you some examples of what I meant, mean. Um, every time we post a letter, every time we board a plane to go on holiday or go somewhere on business, whatever it is, um, we simply take for granted, we don't even think about it how that letter goes from country A to country B, C or D or gets there safely as they do, nor do we really think very much when we get on a plane about how that plane uh, is cared for when it's on the ground, 
where it's going. We know where it's going and we hope it gets there and they usually do. But what we forget and watch, why should we remember, except people like me and academics are interested, is that that kind of activity uh, which links states together at a host of different levels, social, economic, political, diplomatic. It's a kind of, it, it's all based on negotiation in highly specialized global agencies uh, by people well-trained in a particular area of social and political and economic life who might be described as technocratic diplomats. I mean, the IATA, the International Air Traffic Association, the Universal Postal Union, there are a host, a host of such organizations. But to make air transport, air travel, to make postal communications, to take two simple examples, to make all those work efficiently and possible turns on uh, day by day, month by month, continuous, almost continuous negotiation between specialists and experts trying to refine the process of air travel or the process of transferring goods, people and persons from one part of the world to another, trying to refine them and make them more efficient. But all that turns on the capacity of these so-called technocrats, these technocratic diplomats, to negotiate in good faith with their counterparts from other countries. Um, and that, that seems to me to be diplomacy at its, at its very best. We don't think about it, we take it for granted, but without it, you know, the machinery of international communication at whatever level would come to a thuttering halt and we don't want that to happen. So uh, negotiation is what is central to diplomacy and it can take place on a number of levels uh, in different areas involving different kinds of skills. Um, and I called diplomacy a liberal enterprise, if you want my definition, a liberal enterprise because good diplomacy, successful diplomacy, depends on their being present in the negotiation, shared by all those who are taking part in the negotiation. It requires a demonstration that certain values, key values are operating. What are the key values that underpin good diplomacy? restraint on the part of those who do the negotiation. You don't scream and shout at your opposite number. You listen patiently and try and meet him or her in argument in one way or another. Patience, you've got to be willing to sit there and listen, however difficult and boring the topic might be. Empathy, as Claire has demonstrated so well in all her work on the subject, you've got to be able to put yourself in the place of the other person despite the fact that you may be in profound disagreement with that person, you've got to have some capacity to understand why he or she is saying what he or she is saying. Um, these are all civility, politeness. <laughs> I mean, these values are not unique to diplomacy. They, they should, I suppose, uh, operate successfully in private life as well, in business communication or whatever. But um, it, it does seem to me that taking all those values together, you can describe diplomacy as a liberal enterprise designed to negotiate outcomes which will make life, private life, public life, more tolerable than it has been in the past. And that process of negotiation seems to me is continuous. It never stops. We take it for granted. Fair enough. But it's there, it goes on. And it's one of the, the great, how can I put it, one of the great symbols, practical examples of civilization at its best. The fact that you are trying to negotiate with people who don't always agree with you, who may have different, profoundly different ideologies to you. The fact is you are still entering into some kind of 
attempt to get a compromise, to get, that's another value, compromise, get a compromise, a settlement, um, uh, which will enhance life and make general life more tolerable than it has been in the past. So that's a rather roundabout way of defining it, but that's the best I can do at the moment. Yes, <laughs> thank you very much actually for this insightful uh, definition and for this analogy that really explains uh, very well uh, what you mean. And I guess as Clara said, we really need diplomacy more than, than ever. Um, let, let's move to other questions that are arriving. Um, first of all, uh, a couple of questions combined. Um, since diplomacy is a highly cross-disciplinary studying field, which subjects do you think lay down the foundation of diplomacy study? And what is the relevance of diplomatic history to today's diplomatic analysis? Uh, Claire, you mentioned uh, a section of the book is devoted to the role of history, so maybe thank you. Yeah, so um, which subjects are best suited for the study of diplomacy? Is that correct, the first question? Um, yes, it's, um, it's yeah, what, what, what subjects do you think lay down the foundation of diplomacy study? Um, I think it's fascinating that we have few, few courses that are specifically on diplomacy. I know there are some in the Department of War Studies. I taught alongside uh, Jack on statecraft war and diplomacy when I was in the department. Um, so I do know there are courses, but I think dedicated courses on diplomacy would be really interesting to really delve into both the principles of diplomacy, but also case studies and examples of where diplomacy has been so crucial and to look at these practical dimensions that I spoke about that many of the contributors speak about um, of what the role of a diplomat is, how they conduct themselves in the diplomatic space, both looking at the public and the private dimensions. And I think that's something that's especially important is that what goes on behind closed doors um, will often follow certain norms, but then diplomats then have to go into the public space and articulate and legitimize what that has been agreed on. And that often means that there'll be a lot that cannot be shared. There might be ideas um, and discussions that have to remain private in order to advance interests. But understanding that intersection of how um, the public, the private, the political, all um, interact and uh, have an iterative and symbiotic influence on one another is I think really important. I'd love to see more courses on specifically diplomacy that really give a lot of the richness and the depth that we've seen in these chapters from the case studies that really looked at different regions of the world, really gave far greater attention to maybe underrepresented states in the study of international relations and different voices in um, that space. Um, and history, the second part of the question, um, really it provides us access to a real wealth of resources from the archives and i know um, both myself and many in the volumes have benefited from the archives at kew in in the us and um, in france that reveal what takes place behind the scenes and often you can't study that as accurately in the present day. If you look, for example, at what's going on with Brexit, the records of that are not going to be available for many years. The real kind of um, in the weeds, what was going on? What, where did that discussion come from? How was it that they were able to break through or not? We're not going to have access to that. But if we look at history, we can really understand some of the trends, some of the dynamics, the role of personalities, the role of political um, pressure of societal pressures and the socio-economic cultural context and what that did and history therefore gives us both lessons but it also gives us a real wealth of resources and so I think building in far more um, historical case studies to how we study international relations and international security um, and really looking at those diplomatic dimensions will only help um, with providing us with a greater understanding of diplomacy. Can I, Flavia, can I just jump in on that? On yeah, that? sure, sure. I think what Claire raised about the, the points in particular about history are, are really apposite because, you know, of course, diplomats need to have a, a very good understanding of the, the policy, uh, policy context of their own country and the policy that, that they're advocating on behalf of, of their government. But 
I, I always find it astounding just the extent to which um, uh, diplomats and certainly at a ministerial level, the, the understanding of uh, historic context in particular is often really absent for, for huge swathes of the world. Um, and so, you know, looking from a, a British foreign policy lens at different regions of the world in particular, um, you're finding that, yeah, I, I'm thinking in particular of South, uh, of Sub-Saharan Africa, you'll see lots of British uh, ministers and, and often diplomats um, looking at those, at those countries and regions through a lens of, of perhaps UK imperial colonial history, but having a very limited understanding of uh, of tribal history uh, within those regions and countries, and I think that's that's a real issue which needs to be needs to be addressed. I also think so. I think getting that really good historical grounding is crucial. I think we all learn uh, plenty of British history when we're in school and university. I don't think we learn about much about the history of other countries that we are then seeking to engage with. Um, I also think you know we've there's become a seeming trend within certainly within the the UK Foreign Office, whereby uh, diplomats will be subject to, to two-year, three-year postings and then and then rotated and often rotated from one part of the world to somewhere that's very culturally and historically uh, different and I think you know I understand the logic about you know trying to avoid people going uh, native and so on but that, that also that that um, approach also runs the risk that you end up with a cohort of diplomats that are in effect uh, generalist in terms of the skill sets that they have um, but their historical and cultural understanding of the countries that they are then posted to is, is relatively limited. Um, and again, to sort of lean on the example of Sub-Saharan Africa, I think before uh, the, the creation of the new FCDO, um, yeah, it was a, a well-known secret that all of Britain's uh, Africa specialism had, had moved to DFID. And therefore, actually, you know, the UK's approach to, to that part of the world was very much looked at through the development lens rather than a, a sort of uh, a foreign policy and diplomatic lens. Um, so I think that's just something that we need to bear in mind as well. Yeah, thank you very much. I think this, to some extent, respond to one of the questions we have in the chat concerning uh, uh, the um, qualities that a good diplomat should have. And I would argue also that you know, good knowledge of history is one of the uh, qualities that uh, a good diplomat must have, as Alastair has just uh, uh, mentioned. Um, okay, so another um, uh, two questions combined, um, because you mentioned about, you, you talked about uh, multilateralism and you talk about national interest. So on the one hand, uh, how can uh, uh, foreign ministers reconcile national interest, which is the uh, core, uh, or one of the core diplomacy of foreign policy, of course, with the advancement of human rights. And on the other hand, another question, um, which talked about the nationalistic approaches that many countries are having uh, towards the uh, crisis of, of COVID. Uh, so uh, what the future that you see in your, um, uh, concerning multilateralism? So uh, the books, uh, the two volumes reveal a contemporary crisis of multilateralism, or there is some optimism about the future of multilateralism? I think if I can just um, jump in to, to take the first question about uh, the human rights and, and national interest issue, I think you know, it, it's fascinating, and I think that tension has, has, uh, has long been an issue of diplomatic relations. Um, I think, you know, it it varies so much from country to country and region to region. I, I think the, you know, the issue I was talking about, the, the greater influence of, of public opinion on foreign policy making, I think that has made sure that the human rights uh, agenda is, you know, is very much front and center in foreign policy making in, in nations like the UK and the US. Um, but I also think that it's meant that, yeah, we, we I guess we need to remember that a lot of uh, our, a lot of times where countries like the US and the UK have been uh, have been advocating human rights really forcefully, um, it's often been to nations of the world which are in some form or another developing or what used to be we used to classify as developing uh, and therefore countries over which we had a great amount of leverage and therefore yeah we, we almost could afford to be to be advocating on behalf of human rights issues I think what now is a real challenge is where you know what do we do when we are dealing with countries uh, you know obviously China's a great example where we simply don't have that kind of leverage 
and where if we are making forceful uh, if we are advocating forcefully for for human rights issues it's going to come we know it's going to come at the expense of something else uh, and that that is potentially what we would deem more of a core yeah, in inverted commas national interest um so i think it, it's going to be fascinating to see how it, it this plays out and i think it's going to be a real a key theme of foreign policy making in the, in the next uh, year during this century i think it'll be interesting to see the extent to which uh, the public can make their uh, determination for human rights to form a real a key pillar of the agenda heard um, or whether yeah as we've seen a lot with China in recent years those are conversations which take place behind closed doors so as to avoid uh, avoid embarrassment um, but you know the the bilateral uh, announcements and so on are all about trade deals security cooperation and yeah that those kind of things which we which we're more familiar with Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm afraid we have reached the end of the time of our uh, disposal. So I would ask if uh, Claire or Professor Spence, you have any final uh, comments to, um, to add. That's, that's very kind. Thank you, uh, uh, Flavia. No, I don't really have anything more to add. I think I've exhausted all my thoughts for the moment on, on diplomacy. Um, the only point I want to make is really a, an administrative point. Um, I appreciate that many of you perhaps have had questions you wanted to raise, but we've, as uh, our chairman, chairman says, we've run out of time. But there's no reason why you shouldn't raise those questions with us individually or collectively, just through email in the ordinary way, and we'll try our best to answer them. Uh, we can try and maintain some kind of continual dialogue. So if you have further questions or, or, or further arguments you want to advance, advance, even if there are arguments against the, the line that the three of us have been taking, that's all to the better. So let's leave it like that, that um, you know, one, two, we're open to argument and would like to hear from you if you feel there's more to say. The other point to make, and I think um, I'm right in saying this, this is not the only launch which will be taking place over the next few months. There are two or three more that I know of. And again, to find out where those are taking place, um, they will be advertised through King's. And again, you can come in uh, on the Zoom arrangement and. Um, take part. So this is not the end of the argument or the debate. It will be a continuous one through further launches in a variety of places at a variety of times. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, actually, we are indeed receiving a lot of questions, a lot of interest on uh, Claire's work on empathy, a lot of interest again on the role of the diplomat uh, questions for Alastair about the integrated review, which has recently been published. So there are a lot of questions I understand, and I'm sorry we cannot uh, we cannot take all of them. But as Professor Spence said, please uh, do get in touch with the editors individually by email. We are happy to share also you know their contacts, um, and I'm sure they are more than happy to engage with you and to answer your uh, questions in in the future. Uh, okay, well. Thank you very much, uh, uh, everybody, for uh, attending this uh, uh, exceptional uh, uh, book launch. Um, thanks again to the three speakers. Uh, I'm sure you are hearing the virtual round of applause that everybody is attributing to, to you. Congratulations for a great accomplishment. Uh, the uh, video of this uh, event will be available on uh, YouTube because it is uh, recorded. Uh, so you will have the chance to watch it again if you want. Again, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, participating, and uh, see you soon to the next event. Bye bye. <laughs>